So I want to talk about something um, today that's been kind of driving me, um, frankly, bananas for about the past four days. And um, certainly behind closed doors, I've been screaming about it, jumping up and down, um, trying to get anybody to listen. And, and I, I don't know, I just I'm having no luck. So I'm I guess I'm turning to uh, social media, hoping that somebody's going to listen to this and either say, oh, don't worry, that's already being done. No need to be alarmed or. Uh, better yet, just picks up the torch and says, okay, like, let's figure out a way to get this done. But before I do that, I want to put in context why this thing that's been driving me and half of my team crazy um, is, is so important. So so let's, let's focus on New York for a second. Um, and I, I say that because obviously New York is the epicenter of what's going on in the United States right now. And also it's the place for which we have the best data. So as of um, this morning, we have about 1,600 deaths in New York City. Uh, so I'm not including the state, I'm just including the five boroughs. So what do we know about those deaths? Well, you can stratify them and cut them by many different things, but the two things that seem to matter most are age and um, whether a person has a known pre-existing condition. So age, of course, being an independent risk factor, but also these pre-existing conditions such as diabetes, either type 1 or type 2, high blood pressure, lung disease, um, cancer, though, and it's not entirely clear if we're talking about cancer survivors, you know, someone who's 10 years out of cancer versus someone who's actively um, uh, ongoing in, in chemotherapy, for example. Um, but if you slice and dice the data that way, you basically get the following. If you look at the category, I'm doing these in four age buckets, 18 to 44, 45 to 64, 65 to 74, and greater than 75. There's only one death in someone below the age of 18. So I'm just sort of excluding that for the purpose of simplicity. So how do the deaths stack up? Well, 5.8% of those 1,600 deaths are in people aged 18 to 44. But then if you ask a secondary question, which is what fraction of those people had no underlying medical condition, you can't get the exact data because there is some ambiguity in how they're counting people, but I can bracket it to somewhere between 7.8 and 10.9%. So directionally, say 5.8% of the deaths are in people that are 18 to 45, and about 10% of those people have no underlying medical conditions. That's pretty scary um, in terms of relative numbers. If you go to 45 to 64, that represents just under a quarter of the deaths. That's 24.5% of the deaths. But now the percentage of those people who have no underlying medical condition drops. And the bracket here goes somewhere between about 3.4 and 4.3%. When you go up a bracket to 65 to 74, it's almost the exact same. It's just over 24% of deaths are in that age group. Uh, but here, virtually none of these people are free of pre-existing conditions. In fact, it's 0.3% regardless of how you look at the data. And then finally, when you look at people above the age of 75, that represents the remainder of deaths, which is about 45.5%. And again, to our best estimate, somewhere between 03 and 0.6% of those people have no pre-existing condition. So obviously, the younger you are, the greater chance that you are... Um, uh, at risk, let me rephrase that. I want to be very careful. You don't want to interpret this to say that the younger you are, the worse it is to not have a pre-existing condition. Obviously, that's not true. It's just saying that the younger you are, the greater the pool of people that have no pre-existing condition. And that's why we see an inverse relationship with age and death according to pre-existing conditions or not. Okay, so what's the million-dollar question here that is still driving us bananas? 1,600 people have died in New York. And what we really want to understand is, how does this tell us about what's about to happen over the coming months? And the projections based on models are so, um, so disparate across the board. And when you play with the models as much as we've been playing with them, including trying to build our own, which by the way, we've decided is almost a meaningless fool's errand, um, you come to the realization that the models tell you nothing um, because there's just too much data that we don't know. There's, you know, too much information that you can't put into models with confidence that the information itself is correct, and therefore the outputs of the models will tell you anything. So it seems to me we need to do something ASAP. 
which is we need to sample a very large number of asymptomatic people in New York. So um, I haven't done the statistics on this yet, but clearly a biostatistician could do this. But let's just directionally say it's 3,000 people from each borough, 15,000 people who are asymptomatic need to be sampled. Um, they need to have probably two PCR and antibody tests separated by five to seven days. And what we have to understand is, what is the prevalence of coronavirus in asymptomatic people? Now, I'll give you two extreme examples of what you could see and how the impact of that would change our thinking. If you did that experiment and it turned out that 50% of asymptomatic people walking around out there had already been infected with the coronavirus, this would be a very different situation. We'd have much less concern about what's going on because not only would that dilute the case fatality rate, but more importantly, it would tell you that the majority of people that come in contact with this virus are not at risk of dying. And in fact, will just have a minor inconvenience, if anything at all. If that's the case, then we obviously need to focus our efforts on the people who are at risk and you know, bring to an end um, the uh, complete quarantines that are going on. Now, conversely, what if you did that experiment and only 1% of people had been exposed to coronavirus? 1% of asymptomatic people had been exposed to coronavirus. Well, that would be very disconcerting, right? That would mean that your case fatality rate is very high um, and that we have no idea what happens when this virus truly gets out and infects a lot of people. I can't for the life of me understand why we aren't putting virtually every resource we have into understanding this, um, especially now. I mean, you could argue we should have done this a month ago, but now that we have sufficient testing, I mean, the cost of doing this would not be through the roof. Uh, it's about 30 bucks a test. So why don't you round up and call it 100 with some bureaucracy? Two tests is 200 bucks. You know, even if you round it up and said it's going to cost $1,000 per head to do this, with all of the administration that goes into it, it's still a relatively small cost when you consider the cost to our economy. And of course, the medical cost of not having a, a system that can kind of cope with what's, with what's coming, um, especially with so much uncertainty. So I use the example of the New York data up front to kind of give you a sense of where mortality lies and how it relates to pre-existing conditions. But more than anything, what, the, what I'm trying to do is say, like this is a moment for epidemiology to shine and the way you'd want it to shine is to do this type of an experiment. If we don't have a sense of how prevalent this disease is in asymptomatic people, then every one of these models becomes foolish. We really don't know what the r naught is. We really don't know what the transmission looks like from symptomatic to asymptomatic people. I mean, we just don't know anything. And if you don't know anything, you're putting kind of garbage assumptions into models and you're getting garbage outputs that are all over the place. So um, anyway, this is this is sort of my, my plea behind closed doors. I'm continuing to have discussions with people, trying to get people interested in this idea. Um, it, it, this is not the hardest experiment in the world to run, by the way, um, but but it is important. And, and I hope that either it's being done and I'm just unaware of it and somebody can say, Peter, it's, it's being done, here you go. Um, and if it's not being done, I hope somebody out there, um, you know, is interested in um, picking up the torch and running with that.